because we are the answer that God used yes. to change the next generation. Let's breathe a special prayer for our vacation Bible school. Our gracious heavenly Father, we thank you that you're such a good God and that you loved us. You've given us the opportunity to share this great gospel. Now, God, we ask that you open the doors wide and send men, women, boys, and girls who need to hear this great gospel. Lord, we ask that help us to make an impact. Help us to mark their lives. That when they get old, they say, I remember going to communities, vacation by my life was changed. Lord, we want to thank you because we believe in you. Yes. We believe when we, when we say that we put faith in you that you're going to do it. So yes. Lord, we thank you for what you're going to do yes. this week. Lord, everything will be to your glory. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I'm excited. I'm excited what God's going to do. I'm, I'm looking for 100 and 150. I hope this place came to hold. Well, I already had someone say 200 kids coming. I want to see online that kids everywhere. I, I don't get to come, but I watch online. And I see the kids. I was pitching kids looking like they're having fun. I see the videos. I, this year I want to see where kids almost in the street put them. That we are just making a mark on kids' life because you know we're in some serious times. Yes, we are. And we got generations of people who yes. don't know. Yes. And so Christ has put us here. How many years? 70, 58, 82 years to make an impact, not just for us to come in and go out for 82 years. No, no. He put us here to make an impact. Yes. And yes. so even on the generations to come, I'm, I'm, I'm excited about that. Let me get to the task that I've been called to. I've been called, um, and as always, I find it a joy to come. And so when I heard about his need, I, I said, I told my wife, well, we might have to go to uh, the white church. And she had just got through lecturing me about my diet and my own out experience. And she said, well, I can't wait to get to church to give him the sermon. So, so he watch out because she's got a sermon for him about this whole diet thing. But I'm always excited about being here. So let's go to God one more time and thank him for this opportunity. So Heavenly Father, we thank you to some time around your word. Lord, now we ask that you speak to us. We know that you brought us here for a purpose, a special word. And so, Lord, we thank you because we know that your word does not return unto you void. Now let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart, let them be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Amen. If you have a copy of your scriptures, let's look again at our it's found in Ephesians 4, verse 25. Ephesians 4 and 25. And this is what is recorded. Therefore, having put away falsehoods, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor. For we are members one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, do honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupt talk come out of your mouth, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. We'll stop there. You may be seated. I want to speak from the subject, the prerequisites of faith. Meaning the prerequisites of faith. There is a story, or it's, it's a true story, of a guy named Charles uh, Blunden. Charles Blunden was a tightrope walker, the best in the world. Um, he, was, he was so famous at it that people from all over the world literally would come and watch Blunden walk across 
these tight ropes. Well, he would, uh, his most famous tightrope walk was across the mighty Niagara Falls. And so when he went a couple of times, he went one time, he went blind uh, floated, and then one time he went on a bicycle. But his most uh, famous was when he was going to go, uh, what was it, 11,000 feet across. And he did it with a wheelbarrow. And the crowd was there, and they was cheering, and they were saying, you can do it, you can do it, you can do it. And so Blunden, he gets on that little tightrope, and he pushes uh, the wheelbarrow across, and everybody cheers. And then he, he, and then he stands on the other side, and he decides that he's going to go back. And they were cheering, you can do it, you can do it. And he pushed the wheelbarrow all the way back to where, he, to where the crowd was. Now he said to the crowd, I need a volunteer. I need someone to get in the wheelbarrow. He had no takers. And much, that is much like our faith. We speak about faith. We talk about faith. We, 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 we talk about how big faith we have and how our faith can move mountains. But we never put our faith in action. And so today I want to talk about how do you get your faith into action? Not the kind of faith you talk about at church. Not that, 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 I call it that weak faith or that church faith where you say yes and you high five everybody and you say, brother, we can do it. No, I'm talking about on Monday morning on the job. I'm talking about when you get the call on the phone and it does, isn't good news. Where's your faith then? That kind of faith. How did it build that kind of faith? And I believe that this text is tailored to teach us that there are some prerequisites if we're going to level up our faith. If we're going to make our faith this big faith that we can do great things for Christ. For the Bible says that you and I can, will be able to do greater things. How can we do the greater things if we don't have faith? There are some prerequisites. Let's look at a few. First, in verse 25, notice what it says. It says, put away falsehoods. The first prerequisite is that you and I need to put away falsehoods. Now, I know what you're saying. I'm no liar. So I don't have to, t I don't have to listen to the rest of this sermon. Well, let's think again. Come up close. Because all of us tell falsehoods. We hold on to falsehoods. There are false, falsehoods we tell ourselves. Here's a falsehood that some of us tell ourselves. That I'm not smart enough. That I'm too old. God can't use me. God don't really love me like they say down there at their church. That's a falsehood. But the Bible says that you are so special that he knows every hair on your head. And also in John, in John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Listen here, my brother. Listen here, my friend. That God loves you individually and stop telling yourself the falsehood that he doesn't love you. He can't use you. Look throughout the Bible. God uses people all from all kinds of backgrounds. He uses harlots and liars and murderers and old people and young people. What am I trying to tell you? Stop telling the falsehood that God can use you. That falsehood will keep you from, from having your faith grow. You got you to gotta throw away those kind of falsehoods that, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm getting up age now. I heard him say that your former days will be what? Greater than, oh, y'all, we got some Bible readers. I got it, I got it backwards. That your, that your former days will, your, uh, your, woo, I had a mental block. That your, that your days ahead your, will be greater than your former days. I don't know where I got that from. But the point is that you got some great days ahead. Don't go and sit and retire on a bench. I just heard, I just heard, and I just told you that we got vacation Bible school. That should be every generation represented at the vacation Bible school. 
Because there are some things that you can bring that a 20-year-old needs. You've got some wisdoms, you've got some understanding that you can share. And so there's no time where you sit home and, and, and just veg out. God says, stop telling yourself the falsehood. But there's also other kinds of falsehoods. The falsehood that maybe this book is fables and myths. And if this book is a fable and really just filled with myths, then it really has no power. And, really, and therefore, it's just all talk, no action. But I come to tell you that you can trust this book. This book is historically accurate and internally consistent. In other words, you can trust this book. This book, kings and kingdoms have passed away. You can trust every dot and, and, and I you can trust in this book. And when you start to put your faith and understand that this is the word of God, it is, it is God and, and it lives and it, and it speaks. When you believe, you faith. If it's only myths and fables, why do you need faith? I'm trying to help you now. You're wondering why nothing happens in your life and you have no power. Because you don't believe that this is actually the word of God. Shakespeare is dead and there's nothing else could be said. But every time, I need some witnesses here, every time you flip over to a verse, something new and fresh comes out. God uncovers himself and reveals himself fresh and anew every time you open this book. You can read John 3, 6 a hundred million times and every time you open it and you look at it, it's something fresh and new. Why? Because this book lives. And because this book lives, you believe that, you'll watch your faith grow. You'll see your faith propel you to excellence, to greater and bigger things. So stop believing the falsehood. Then Paul says in verse 26, he says, let's look at it. 426, it says, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. In other words, my friend, Paul tells this church in Ephesus that if you're going to experience unity and you're going to experience greater faith, you've got to learn how to manage your emotions. That's essentially what Paul was saying. Now he picked he picked anger because anger is a human experience and anger is one of the most deadly emotions that we all can experience. And the way this is written, it's, it's written in such a way where it says, do not sin, but because you are going to sin, don't, don't uh, let your sin or, or anger get out of control. Jesus himself, he got angry. You remember when he turned over the money tables. He went into the temple and he saw them gambling and he got him angry. The Bible says he turned over the money table. But what we see about his anger is something different. His anger had a proper motivation. He was angry not at the sinner. I mean, not at, not, uh, not at the sinner, but he was angry at the what? The sin. That's proper motivation. Most of us are angry at other people. We, 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 we angry at the system. We, we got all kinds of reasons why we're angry. But Jesus, when he was angry, he was angry because of the sin, not the sinner. He was angry of the sinner. And notice that his sin also had a duration. I mean, he didn't, he didn't, keep, a, he didn't keep and harvest uh, anger for a long time. He didn't go from temple to temple saying, okay, they over here gambling and I can't trust none of y'all. That's something, ooh. That's some of y'all. You've been hurt at a church, and you've been scarred. You go from church to church. I, well, I don't go to church because them people down there. You know, I was at First Baptist uh, Oklahoma in 1973, and somebody told me I couldn't sit on the back row, and so now I'm, I don't go to church. It's 2024, but you're still angry. Anger should have a duration. So all I'm trying to tell you is that even anger should be controlled. 
But also Paul is pointing to us to the fact that all of us need to help manage our own emotions. Too many people have made bad, bad choices because their emotions were out of control. I shouldn't say too many. Let's just see who I have made a whole lot of bad decisions with my emotions. And so the Bible says if I'm going to build your faith, if I'm going to use you in a greater, bigger way, because God has a plan each for you. Every one of us got a plan. No matter where you are in, the, in life, God said I can use you. But I can't use you if you hold on and with your emotions. If you allow your emotions to lead you, all you got to do is go to the prison. You go to the prison, go from cell to cell, and ask them, how'd you end up here? And they'll tell you, well, one day I was angry. One day I was mad. One day I was sad. It's always emotions. Emotions are had way out, far from God. And so Paul says, check your emotions. But then the third thing I see, the third thing I see, not only are we to get rid of falsehoods, not only then are we to check our emotions, but notice what he says in 27. In verse 27 says, 27 says, um, and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief steal no longer, but rather let him labor doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone that's in need. So the third thing is, stop stealing. Now I know I'm not, I, I, don't even, I shouldn't even have to say this, but stop stealing. But I see, but I see on the news, I see people running into stores yeah. with mob mentality, yeah. grabbing all that they can, and then run out. Yeah. So I have to say it. The church has to say it. Stop stealing. Yeah. But I want to talk. This is not even where I want to go. But I want to talk to you who buy the stolen property. You are participating in stealing. Stop buying stuff. You know you he don't own a Gucci shop. Stop buying a Gucci pack from that boy. You know he didn't get that out the store, but that's not where I really want to go because I know most of you will sit back and say, well, good, because that's not me. I don't steal. I don't buy stolen property. But let me ask you this. How much time have you stole from God? When, uh, this week, if I could play your life on the screen, how many times did you speak to God? How many times did you pray this week? How many times, uh oh, this is, this is going to get tight right here. How many times did you share your faith? That's God's time. You and I need to work on giving God his time. And my brother, my sister, I want you to know this. I want you to know this, that being in church is not always giving God's time. You see, because you and I are in relationship with God, and so sometimes you and I have to spend personal time with him. When the last time you went out and just walked and said prayers for people in your neighborhood? That's time with God. When the last time you sat out on your patio and just thank God for where he brought you and thank God for how he's keeping you? When the last time you spoke to him, just you and him? That's what God is saying. You could have stolen time this week. If you're going to build your faith, you got to stop stealing time. What about, what about your resources? Uh-oh. When the last time you supported God's work? Now, here's what I'm talking about. Here's what, don't get nervous. Because what people will start saying, well, I ain't got much. But I remember of a boy who had five loaves of bread and two pieces of fish, and God took that thing and fed a whole multitude of people. It's not what you have. You leave it to God. Give him just a little bit of what you have. Give it what is his, and let him do what, what you give him, and he will do great and mighty things. So that's how, so I wonder, I wonder, my friend, how much, 
of your resources have you stolen? What about your talent? I look over this room, I, I bet you if I just pass the mic and I ask you, tell me what your talent is, what you're gifted in, what can you do? And everybody, everybody would have something they could say. Oh, I, well, you know, I, could, I, I know how to put my foot in a pound cake. Now, I don't know about nobody else. I don't need nobody to pat me on the back on that because I know I can put my foot in a pound cake. Okay, how many pound cakes did you make for God? To take it over to the neighbor and say, I just want to bless you with this. I don't got much, but I know how to make a pound cake. Here, take the pound cake. Some of you are creative and God has given us all some creativity within us. God is saying, how much of that have you given to God? Or some of you and all the young generation, they spend all the time with their talent trying to get likes on me social media. But they never stop and wonder, when can I give this back to God? And so you ought to reflect if you want your faith to grow. Stop stealing time, your talent, and your resources. Give God what is his and watch your faith grow expeditionally. And so that's all I really come to tell you. That if you want to grow your faith, meet these prerequisites. God sent me to tell you that you might be looking here at the church for numbers. No. God is saying what you need is greater faith. You build your faith. You watch what you can do with a small number of people. You see, when Jesus decided to make an impact, what did he do? He went and got 12 people. 12 people who met the requirements, who had expeditional faith. He had to take them and he, he showed them miracles and he did all kinds of things to build their faith where well, he could say, okay, now we're getting ready to impact the world. Yeah. What are you guys getting ready to impact? Yeah. You gotta grow your faith. Yes, you gotta use your talents. Yes. You gotta let go of some falsehoods. Yes. You gotta stop stealing from God and watch him grow your faith. Yes. He'll, do, he'll do great things in your life because I know, sure as I'm standing here, that he's got a plan for each one of you. Yes. A great plan. Bigger than what you can even imagine. Yes. He want to take some of you some places you can't even dream of. Right. He wants you to speak in front of people you can't even understand what they're saying. You start seeing bigger and better because God, God will do that when you have faith. Yes. When you got little faith, you sit and trying to sustain what you already got. You're not trying to grow. You're not trying to do anything. You're just, you're just existing. God said, you got to grow your faith. But you can't do it unless you meet these requirements. Let's pray. Eternal God, thank you for these few moments we had together. We thank you that you showed us that we need to have greater faith. We can't have greater faith until we meet the requirements. God, help us to meet the requirements. Help us to reflect over our lives. Help us to reflect as a church. How do we, how do we meet the requirements so that we can have greater works? Because we know that you want to do great things, not just in the church, but you want to do great things in my own individual life. So God, help me to meet the requirements. Help me have faith that can move mountains. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, before I sit down, I want to give you an opportunity to be You can't grow faith if you don't have faith. So let's start at the beginning. It's a relationship with Jesus Christ. I don't want to assume everybody in the room have a relationship with them. I, and notice I didn't say church membership. I said a relationship. And so I want to give you an opportunity to meet this Christ that we speak about. He's available. He's here. For the Bible says 
Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Mm -hmm. And if any man hear my voice, I will come and I will sup with him and him with me. That means he's ready. He's calling. He's willing to come in your life and change you forever. How do you know he will? Because he changed my life. Yes. And I have yes. ever been the same. Yes. Then there are some who says, preacher, I need prayer because I want great faith. I want to, I want to be used by God. I want to do big and great things, but I'm struggling. <laughs> Just be honest, I'm struggling. Pray for me. Help me build my faith. Help me meet the requirements. If that is you, and I know what you're saying. The enemy will say, you don't have to go down there. He knows your heart. No, it's an, it's an act of obedience. 